Last week, we had a very interesting conversation that was raised before the class began. And that is going to inspire today's discussion. The class posed the question, what would you do if you had an envelope in which it had recorded your time of death, would you open the envelope or would you not open the envelope? That was the question that was posed last week. And it evolved into the conversation about death and dying and a person's own demise. And there was a request to do a whole class on it. I asked the audience, should we do a class on death and dying? And overwhelmingly the answer was yes. And the truth is I was a little bit surprised that there was so much interest in such a morbid subject. And then I realized this is the most fascinating and terrifying subject yet. Of course you want to hear about it. But I figured if we are going to do it, let us do it right. And this is a huge subject and there's multiple angles to try to attack it with. Now, when I researched the subject, I got a sense that we're going to revisit some of these subjects and, and expand upon them when we progress in our study of the 13 Principles of Faith, which we're doing on the Torah 101 podcast, of course. We're going to be talking about the reward and punishment and the afterlife and the soul's journey and eschatology. And this subject will surface again, but today in our current discussion I want to divide the subject into two components. First, we're going to talk about death. What is it? What does it mean? How does it work? What it is like? And when we finish part one, everyone's going to have a very strong urge to try to prepare for this moment. So part two will be the practical of this discussion. We're going to talk about how to prepare for dying. What should you do to make sure that we have the best transformation process possible? We believe that death is a crossover. It's almost the equivalent of birth in a certain way, almost in reverse. Before someone is born, they're in a different world. And there's this crossover moment where they enter our world. It's a very different world. You know, the constraints of the womb are very different than the constraints of our universe. But nevertheless, they're different perspectives. And when someone is in the womb, all their world exists in that, in that environment. And then they open up the door to a bigger world. And that's this world. And death is a similar process. It's the birth of us in our new existence. But it's something we have to prepare for. But it is something that we have to prepare for. And if we don't prepare for it, we're in big trouble. So part one is going to be what death actually is, how it works. And part two is gonna be how we prepare for it and make sure that we have a successful death and transformation and cross over into the next world. I had a teacher in high school, Mr. Goodman. He used to uh, always trash talk about how good he was at basketball, a science teacher. And he said, hey, Walby, I'll give you an A. I'll give you an A plus if you beat me on a one-on-one. Now, for our international listeners, a one-on-one means one basketball player versus another basketball player with no teammates who wins the game. If I win, I get a straight A+. Plus. If he wins, I get a zero. So what did I say? I said, deal. Bring it. Let's go. And then he said, well, my fingertips are cracked from the chalk on the chalkboard. When they heal, we'll play. Now they have yet to heal, so we have yet to play. And it's kind of a shame because it would have been nice to have at least one A in high school. But why am I telling you about Mr. Goodman? Because Mr. Goodman had a line that he said all the time. He was our science teacher throughout high school. And he said his goal 
is to live forever. He wants to be eternal, live forever. And then he rationalized it by saying, well, the longer you live, the more innovations that there are in science and health and medicine, in longevity. So the longer you live, the longer you are likely to live. So he wants to kind of beat death by keep on living longer as they make new innovations and new inventions and new scientific discoveries and new advances in medicine to just outrun death. That is what Mr. Goodman wanted. Now, this is not a Jewish ideal. We want to live in the real world, which is Olam Abba. That's the goal. For us, in this world, even if we wanted to live forever, that ship has sailed. With the sin of Adam, death is mandatory. Whether you live for a couple of hours or you live for 969 years, the fate of all humanity in this world is to die. Thank you, Adam and Eve. There is no escaping from that fate. It's the future of everyone, regardless of your relative holiness. The Talmud tells us that there were four people who died only because of the sting of the serpent, meaning they had no sins, and therefore, unless or outside of the absent of the fact that they were condemned to die because they were stung by the serpent, they wouldn't have died. There were only four people whose deeds were so meritorious that they only died because they were condemned to die by dint of being a human. But everyone has to die. There's no escaping. Now, I don't know what happened to Mr. Goodman. I hope his fingers healed. But when I was a junior in high school, 11th grade, his wife was diagnosed with a very aggressive form of cancer. I remember thinking just as a kid, that he kind of sobered up from that idyllic and naive view of life, and he recognized the fleeting nature of what we have over here. I hope he's still alive. I hope he's still living his dream. I hope he's still one step ahead of the angel of death. But you could only outrun it for a certain amount of time. Now, for us, we're realists. We're not trying to live forever. We know we're going to die. And you tell me, or you told me, that you want to hear about it. So let's go. We're going to do it. You ready? Let's begin. What is death? Is that a good question? Is that a reasonable question? What is death? Just define it for me. Well, the answer, I think most people would say, Most people who have our background, who have a baseline understanding of what a human actually is, people would say that death is the separation of body and soul. You have a soul within you, and you have a body, and when those two go their separate ways, that is the definition of dying. Now, on a more precise level, we would take that idea a little bit further. It's not just the separation of body and soul. It's the restoration of body and soul to their origin. Man is a hybrid. Man is a fusion of opposites. When man was created in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the verse says that God formed man dust from the earth. And he blew into his nostrils the soul of life. Man was created, so to speak, on two tiers. Dust from the ground and blowing the soul of life into his nostrils. Says Rashi, man was created from opposites. He was made from the lower spheres And he was made from the upper spheres. His body is from the lower spheres. And his soul is from the upper spheres. From a sphere even higher 
than the highest, loftiest angels. So in this world, man exists as an unnatural fusion of polar opposites. He has a body, and the body comes from the lower spheres, and the body is pulling man down to the earth to its origin. And he has a soul, and the soul comes from the higher spheres, and the soul is pulling man to its origin, up. And that's why man is erect. Man is strung between these two worlds, suspended between heaven and earth. And each one of these halves are dueling for primacy. Each one of these two opposites, the two opposite components of a person's makeup, wants to be the central one, the primary one. And we call that free will. The reason why we have free will is because of this unnatural existence, this unnatural marriage, this uneasy harmony of these two opposites. We have to choose. Are we going to favor the element of us that's pulling us up back to its origin? Or are we going to favor the element of us that's pulling us down, the body, earth, dust from the ground, pulling us to the physical and to the material? Free will on the higher level. It's not just a decision which behavior, which action to choose. It's which element of ourselves is our primary, is our identity. Are we going to live as a soul or as a body? Those are very, very, very different things. Are we going to veer to the body, favor it, or are we going to veer to the soul and favor it? Which is why you see so much variability in humans. You have amazing tzaddikim, righteous people that are like angels. You have people that actually became angels. And you have people that are terrible, awful, destructive villains, evil people, and they're from the same species. Only humans have so much variability. And the reason why is because we have opposites. And it's possible for man to choose to live as a soul. And it's possible for man to choose to live as a body. And the soul is loftier than the angels, the highest angels, and man has potential to be that. And the body is worse than the worst animals, and man has potential to be that. The spectrum of what humanity can become is absolutely vast. But that dynamic, it only exists in your lifetime. Death is the separation of those two parts, the two parts that you were comprised of. It's the ending of the hybrid. The body goes back to its origin. The soul does the same. And free will ceases. So what do we have? We're trying to define death. We have the separation of body and soul. And we have more specificity. We have the soul going back to its origin. The body going back to its origin. And the end of free will. But we want to be even more precise than that. This is a little bit of a subtle point. So we said death is a separation of body and soul. But death also refers to cessation of utility. Something stops working. What stops working? Does the soul stop working? Or does the body stop working? Or do both? So there's a very important Talmud. This is featured in the book of Nida, the very last book of the Talmud, on page 31a. And it tells us there are three partners in man, father, mother, and God. The father contributes the white stuff. What does that mean? It means he provides the biological matter for everything white, namely the bones and the sinews and the fingernails, and the brain, and the white part of the eye. And the mother contributes the red. And what's that? That's the skin, that's the flesh, 
And that's the hair. And that's the black part of the eye. And God gives him also some stuff. The spirit, the soul, cluster upon him the countenance of face, vision of the eye, the ability to hear of the ear, the ability to speak of the mouth, the ability to walk of the feet, insight, and intellect. And when a person's time to die, when it comes a person's time to die, the Almighty takes his contribution. He withdraws what he gave. And what the parents gave, he leaves. A dead body contains the contributions of mom and dad. And it's useless. It can't see, it can't speak, it can't walk, it can't think. It doesn't hear. It doesn't have countenance of face, it doesn't have a visage. You have an eye, it's useless. You have ears, useless. The Almighty gives the soul the spiritual half that makes it all work. Death is the withdrawal of the divine life source that animates the body. The soul is withdrawn. The soul that comes from the heavenly sphere is taken away. And consequently, you are left with a useless body. It doesn't work. Now, in computer hardware, there's a term for that. You have a computer. It doesn't work. You can't fix it. It's called a brick or a paperweight. With death, man becomes a brick or a paperweight. Just worse. Just, just worse. Because death of the body, it's not just it becomes a brick and a paperweight. It becomes a liability. It begins to decompose. And the mice want a piece of it. And the vultures are circling overhead. And the worms and maggots descend upon the cadaver. The body to be buried soon. There's a major insight over here. Death is not just the separation of body and soul. It's not just the end of the unnatural marriage of body and soul. It's not just the end of the period of free will. Death is the disabling of the body. Death orients around God withdrawing the soul and thereby the body ceases to work. So if we have to pinpoint at which part, which component of man is actually affected by death, the answer is the body. Because the body used to work and now it doesn't work. What about the soul? How does death affect the soul? So if you read the Talmud, it seems that the soul itself is not affected by death. God just withdraws the soul, and that's it. The soul's removal, separation from the body is seamless. That's what it seems from this Talmud. And that, in fact, may be true. But here's the critical insight. The experience of death for the soul depends on the level of entanglement that the soul had with the body. I want to repeat that just so everyone understands what I'm saying here. Death affects the body. And everything that is enmeshed in the body. To the degree that the soul is entangled in the body, the soul is also compromised by death. The soul also suffers with death. When a person chooses the option of free will to live as a body, it's not just the body operating. It's the totality of man. The soul now becomes entangled in the body. And therefore, if you want to remove the soul and make the body inoperable, 
disable the body because the soul is now so entangled in the body the soul has a very unpleasant experience of death now just to clarify this point let's look at the talmud the talmud the book of moed katan on page 28b going into page 29a tells us as follows amar rabbi hanina Rabbi Hanina says, Kasha Yitzias Neshama Minagruf. The soul's exit from the body is as painful as Kitsip, or is as difficult as Kitsipore Befi Haveshet. As pulling a knotted rope through the eye of a ship's rigging. You have a thick rope and you have to pull it through a hole, and the hole is really small. You got to really, really yank it hard to get it through. Here we have a description of death. For the soul. Death for the soul, says the Talmud, is very difficult and a very painful process. You have to pull it really hard, you have to yank it to get that knotted rope through the hole. Sounds like a very painful ordeal. Now, one page earlier in the same book of Talmud, the book of Moikatan 28a, we read about a very different kind of death, a very benign kind of death. It tells us the great sage, Rava, Rava incidentally is the name that appears most frequently in all of Talmud. Out of the thousands of names that appear, Rava's name is the one that appears most, most often. It tells us that Rava was sitting in front of Rav Nachman, another name that appears very frequently in the Talmud, and he was on his deathbed. Rav Nachman was on his deathbed. And Rava sees the Rav Nachman is starting to slip away. He's starting to die. And Rav Nachman tells Rava, I need you to speak to the angel of death. Tell him to go easy on me. So Rava was surprised by this. He says, wait a minute, you're a great sage. You're like an angel. What are you worried about the angel of death? You could overcome him. You don't need my help. You're a great sage. Why do you need my help to overcome the angel of death? So if Nachman responded to him, in this world, I can't flex my prestige, my honor. Compared to the angel of death, we're all vulnerable. And then Rava makes a request, an unusual request of Rav Nachman. You're about to pass. Do me a favor, after you pass and appear and go to the spiritual world, please appear to me in a dream. I want to hear more about your experience. So he says, it's a deal. Rav Nachman passes away and he appears to Rava in a dream. And Rava asks him, how painful was death? You were really worried about it, right? How bad was it? What was it like? So he explained, it was like this. It was like removing a hair from milk. Very gentle and seamless and easy process, gliding the hair out of milk. But nevertheless, if the Almighty says to go back to this world, to the physical world, and do it again, even though I had a very benign death, I would never agree to go back. Why? Because my encounter with the angel of death was so traumatic. I don't want to do it again, even though ultimately it was like slipping hair out of milk. The angel of death, the confrontation that Rav Nachman had with the angel of death was so terrifying, he did not want to do it again, even though ultimately the death was not so painful. Why is the angel of death so terrifying? I don't know. He doesn't tell us. But elsewhere in the Talmud, in the book of Avodah page 20b, the Talmud gives us a very scary description of what the angel of death looks like. It tells us it's an angel that's completely covered in eyeballs. And at the time of someone's death, he stands on the head or near the head of the patient, 
and he's brandishing a sword, and at the tip of the sword is a piece of poison. And once the sick person, person on, the, on their deathbed, they see the angel of death, they get terrified, and they open their mouth agape, and he flings the poison into his mouth, and that kills him, and that causes him to decompose and to rot and to put putrefy, and that's why his chain, and that, and that is why a dead person's face changes. That's a pretty terrifying angel to meet, you would imagine. Rav Nachman met him, and he says, I don't want to meet him again, even though he did not have a very intense death. Even if you have a pleasant death, you don't want to do it twice. So here's the question. In the very same book of Talmud, we have two very different descriptions of death. We have this very pleasant description of taking a hair out of a glass of milk. doesn't sound to be so intense. It seems to be very seamless. And then we have another description of yanking a knotted rope through a ship's riggings. Elsewhere in the Talmud, this intensity is echoed, the book of Yoma, page 20b. It says that there's a, there's a sound that is so loud, it echoes and reverberates, for those who know how to hear it, from one end of the world to the other. And that is the sound of the soul streaming at a time that it leaves the body. So we have a description of a very painful process. And then we have the description of Rav Nachman's death, a very pleasant or comparatively pleasant process. Which is it? What is death actually like? So here's the answer. And this is a very central point. This is maybe the most important point. Death is not a uniform, universal experience. Body and soul are separated. But the separation of body and soul at death, that hinges on the interrelationship and entanglement that they had at that time. So for the righteous, who don't allow their soul to be affected by the body, who make the right free will choices, who favor their spiritual selves, they preserve the purity of their soul. They resist temptation. They make the correct choices. Their soul does not become enmeshed in their body. For them, it's relatively easy to disentangle these two. Seamless. Like slipping hair out of a glass of milk. The later sages gave a different description to this. It's like removing fleshy garments. You have a fleshy shirt, and you just unzipper it. You have a fleshy pants, and you just remove it. The soul is like the body, and the body is like the garments, like the clothing. And for the righteous who don't allow those two to become enmeshed and entangled, it's seamless, it's easy. It's not so bad. For the sinners who have gotten hopelessly entangled in their body, who have allowed their soul to become compromised and contaminated and sullied, the soul is not pure anymore. For them, death is a very unpleasant experience. Now, this is not binary. It's not just these two extremes. The Talmud tells us in the book of Brachos, page 8a, there are 903 different types of death. The harshest one is called Askara. The most benign and mild one is called Nishika. And Askara is like yanking out branches of thorns that are entangled in a clump of wool. And Nishika is like pulling a hair out of milk. Now, it's just a loud car in the background here. Now, you will be happy to learn that there is a chapter titled 903 Ways to Die 
in my upcoming book, where we study this subject with intense rigor. But don't worry, the book, perhaps unlike this podcast, is not really morbid. It's very cheerful, but it is definitely rigorous and intense, but positive intensity. But this happens to be a chapter that grabs people's attention. But until you get the book, we have now developed the idea of what death is. It's the separation of body and soul. It's the undoing of the unusual marriage of opposites. It's the disabling of the body and everything else that is associated with it. What happens to the soul? That depends completely on the relative state of the soul at the time. Is it the removal of the fleshy garments? Is it the gliding milk out of a glass? I'm sorry. Is it the gliding of a hair out of a glass of milk? Or is it something much more difficult and painful? Now, we have explained what death is. There are, of course, many more and there are, of course, many more questions that are unanswered. So, for example, what happens to the body is pretty self-explanatory. Where does the soul go? What are the various stages of death? What happens to the day that you die versus the moment of death versus the period between death and burial versus when a person is put into the ground before it's covered up? The first seven days after you die, the first 30 days after you die, there's a lot more to discuss on this subject. What about the afterlife? What exactly is that all about? But in our next session, I want to discuss the next element of our quest, namely, how do we prepare for a day of death? How do you prepare for dying? But before we get there, I want to address the envelope question. The envelope that we started off our discussion with that triggered this whole subject. You have an envelope. In it, it says your day of death. What do we say about that? Do we open it or do we not open it? So first thing we, we have, so the first thing we have to say is that the Talmud addresses this. In the book of Sachem, page 54b, it tells us that there are seven things that are completely concealed and obscured from a person. Number one, the day of their passing, the day of their death. Are you curious to know the other six? Are you interested to know the other six things that you cannot know? Well, here they are. Number two, the day of the consolation. What that means is a discussion in the commentators. The day that you will be consoled from your troubles. The depth of the, uh, the depth of judgment. A person does not know what is in the heart of his fellow. That's number four. A person does not know exactly what will bring them profit. A person does not know when Messiah will come and the kingdom of David will be restored. A person does not know when the evil empire will be destroyed. Those are the seven things the Talmud tells us in the book of Sachem, page 54b, that a person does not know it is obscured from them. So a person cannot know the day that they die. Nevertheless, there is a very interesting discussion of the Talmud in the book of Shabbos, page 30a, going into 30b. It's telling us about David. King David made a request from the Almighty. Ribono Shalom, master of the world. Let me know when I'm going to die. So God responded, it is a decree before me that we do not reveal to flesh and blood the day of their passing. Sorry, that's not an option. I know you're close to me. You're a king. You're not used to having your requests denied. Nevertheless, this you cannot know. So David says, you know what? Okay, I'll accept that. But at least tell me what day of the week I'm going to die. And David got the worst answer. 
because God responded to him, you're going to die on Shabbos. And the problem with that is that when a dead body on Shabbos, we cannot tend to it. The greatest thing you could do for a person who is dead or has recently passed is to treat the body in the proper way. It's to bury the body promptly in a way that's very dignified for that body. David's going to die on Shabbos, and he's very disappointed about that. And he says, okay, could we change that? Could we amend it? Could we push it off to Sunday? That's a, re- that's, a reasonable re- that's a reasonable request. Let's push it off to Sunday. And God says, sorry, it's not an option. Because the day that you die is the day that your son becomes king. And I'm not going to allow you to have even one second more of a monarchy in the time that is destined for Solomon. One kingdom does not encroach on another kingdom, even a hair's breadth. So David says, okay, fine. Sunday's out of the, out of the options, it's out of the cards. It's not an option. I'll take one day less. Kill me on Friday. I'll forfeit one day for Solomon, but at least I'll be buried in a proper way. Friday, right before Shabbos, no problem. I am willing to forfeit one day. So God responded, no, I'm not willing to do that. Because one day of your life, you're doing mitzvos, you're studying Torah. I prefer one day of your life more than a thousand sacrifices. One day is so powerful. I cherish it so much, I'm not willing to give it up. You're going to die on Shabbos. That is not going to change. So David said, okay, I'm going to still try. Now we have a principle that the angel of death has no control over a person if they're studying Torah. Torah is magna umatzla. Torah protects a person and saves a person. So David would light candles Friday night and start studying with intensity every single Shabbos until it was time for Avdallah, until Shabbos was over. 26 hours of uninterrupted study every single Shabbos. I will outfox the angel of death. I imagine during the rest of the week, he would drive like a maniac. No seatbelt, no speed limit, because after all, he is impervious to death the rest of the week. The time for David's demise arrives. It's Shabbos. And the angel of death comes to his palace and tries to take David. And David's studying, and there's like a wall protecting him. He's completely shielded. He's completely impregnable to the angel of death. So what did the angel of death do? He made some noise in the background. There's noise in the gardens, the palatial gardens of David. There's noise. So David's studying, and he hears the noise. And he's like, I'm going to go and investigate, but I'm not going to stop studying. I'm not going to fall for the tricks. I'm not going to stop studying. So he's walking out, and he's studying. I don't know if he had a book with him or not, or a scroll. But he's going outside on Shabbos and studying. And he's traveling through his vast gardens, And the angel of death removed one of the stairs, one of the stairs of the garden. He just pulled it out. So David's studying as he's walking. Maybe he's looking in the scroll, but he misses a step. And he tumbles down. And he's like, well, what's going on? Boom. He's vulnerable for a second. He's grabbed by the angel of death. And David is dead on the floor. Now, there was an interesting postscript to the story Solomon is informed David has passed, but now it's Shabbos. The body of a cadaver is mutsa. Mutsa means you cannot touch it or move it on Shabbos. So Solomon runs to the academy. What do I do? David's deceased body, David's corpse is in the gardens. And the dogs are hungry. And I don't want them to start gnawing at, chewing at David's 
flesh? Am I allowed to move it out of the sun into the shade? And they said to him, no, sorry, you can't do it. However, there's a way to do it. There's a loophole. You take either a child, put it on David's chest, or a loaf of bread. And by doing that, the body of David, so to speak, becomes subject to the other thing, which is not Marksa, and therefore you can move David's body, provided that you're also moving with it something else that is more valuable. And Solomon reacted to the situation. You know, David is king of the world, king of the Jews, but now he's dead, and a living dog is better than a dead lion. So we don't know when we're going to die. And even if we find out, we cannot outfox God. So you can never get that envelope, even if you're a prophet. But nevertheless, we at least now know what death is all about, what happens, or at least the general picture of what happens when someone dies. We have the separation of body and soul. We have the end of the unusual era of free will. You don't know when you're going to die because that would disrupt the free will. But now we have a very important challenge ahead of us. Now that we are armed with this information, what do we do now when we're still alive? How do we prepare for our moment of crossover for our moment of death? As usual, my email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com.